Our most gracious Heavenly Father, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob, and our God, we humbly bow before thee at this time to thank thee for this opportunity once again to be able to assemble together to continue our study of thy word. We pray that thou will help each of us to come to a better understanding of thy plan and purpose for this earth and the requirements that each of us are required to meet. We thank you for the many blessings that thou continues to bestow upon each of us. We pray for thy forgiveness of our sins, of our shortcomings, our many weaknesses. And if it be thy will at the return of thy son to this earth to establish thy kingdom, we pray that each of us might receive a part therein. In Christ's name, we humbly approach thy throne. Amen. Amen. Um, thank you for, for that. So we have studied five of the rebellions that were in the wilderness. And right now we're on number six. So number five, what was unique about number five? The fifth rebellion. There's a couple things that were unique about it. Let's see, is that where punishment begins? Yes, Walter is absolutely correct. That's where the punishment begins. Why did the punishment begin with number five? Somebody said because they had the law. I don't know who said it, but that's right. Was that you, Fonda? Yeah. Well, whoever said it, you get an A+. Plus. So they were given the law by Moses, and then they immediately rebelled, made a golden calf, and all of that. So the number six, we're, we're approaching it. What did, what did God want to do with number five when they rebelled and made the golden calf? What was his initial punishment? Wipe them out. To destroy them all, as Roger said. And Moses interceded. He went up there for another 40 days and 40 nights to pray for intercession. And anyway, 23,000 of them died at the hands of the Levites, which is not a small number. Um, and what, what happened then was God said, I'm not going to forget this. And 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10 you really see his wrath coming out, that his anger is right there. And all they have to do is do something wrong and it's set ablaze. So in Numbers 11, it's, uh, can we get a reader for that? Let me see who's up. Uh, I think we um, have Fonda first. Am uh, I muted, Walter? Hi, this is Walter. Walter? Yes. Oh, you can hear me. Okay. Yes, ma'am. I can hear you. I, my, I don't have my mute button on for some reason. Anyway, I don't see it on my screen. Yeah, you're in mute. Well, that's good because we want you to talk. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The Sixth Rebellion. Complaining. Oh, door. I have that. <laughs> uh, fire from the Lord. Now the people complained about their hardships in the hearing of the Lord. And when he heard them in his anger was aroused. The fire from the Lord burned among them and consumed some of the outskirts of the camp. When the people cried out to Moses, he prayed to the Lord and the fire died down. So that place was called Taborah because the fire from the Lord had burned among them. So I hope you'll forgive my levity, but I'm going to insert it so that you remember better. So when anybody compliments you on something you've done or something you've said, I always say uh -oh. immediately give credit to God so you won't be eaten by worms because Herod gave a great speech in Acts and he didn't give credit to God and he was eaten by worms. And my second one is don't complain or you'll have to go through the fire, which is this one. It's um, quite poignant. And then, uh, what was the other one? I think it was, they were blaming God for something and they got bitten by snakes. And that's the second set of 10. And I think they were complaining then again too. So um, it's not a good idea when the Lord had blessed them in so many ways 
Yeah, we don't really think of complaining uh, as a really heavy sin. We think of that as like, oh, we all complain all the time. We complain about our food. We complain about the weather. Most people complain about their health. Most people complain about their wife or their husband. But <laughs> um, what's meaningful here is that the Lord heard it. What do you think made the Lord's anger be so aroused by this? Faithlessness. That's one thing. What had he done for them all along? He fed them. Yeah, it's in Nehemiah 9. It's in the Psalms. It's in Hebrews. It's everywhere in Scripture. He took care of their every need. Okay, so he provided food, clothing, their, their clothes did not wear out or their shoes on their feet, nothing. They didn't have to do anything. They didn't have a job at all. They went from being slaves 24-7, 365, where they were under the whip all the time, to not having anything they had to do in particular, except for gather the manna and move whenever the camp moves. So... How do you think God felt about them complaining about the hardships? And I'm like, what hardships would these be? What do you think they were complaining about specifically? They didn't have the stuff they had at Egypt, you know, regular. Um, they didn't have onions yeah. and garlic. Snakes and melons. I complain about that. <laughs> the thing well, about it is like, it's like telling God what he's doing for you isn't good enough. Well, they had to eat the same thing. You know, if, if we ate the same meal every day for years, no change, it, it would be a challenge. They jazzed it up, Roger. They jazzed it up, you know, with what they did have. A little, yeah. ketchup, a little ketchup fixes everything. But it's like meatloaf. How many ways can you fix meatloaf? And after a while, it's, it's meatloaf. <laughs> but they yeah, so that so nobody oh, really they have a right to complain. I'm on God's side of that argument. Me too. I'm just saying it would be a challenge, though. For so let's zero in on that one word. And if you want to look it up on your phone for the blue blue letter Bible, anybody um, would complain. Hardships. What hardships have they suffered in the wilderness? All I can think of is heat sand you know I, I i they had to to when they went to the facilities they had to bury it um i can't i'm picking up the manna but i can't think of anything else was well, so, were they on the move all the time or did they stop and camp for you know months on end there were there were about 20 campsites so if i roll back to the beginning over 40 years yeah. i'm gonna show you we're going to go all the way back. So this map. So these are the stages in the wilderness, and there's like 19. <coughs> okay, great, actually. So every couple of years, they pack everything up and ship it out. So these were they were they would stay in these places for quite a long time, and then the the cloud would move and they would move, and these are the first ten rebellions. So we're on number six right here about complaining. Whoops, and then it's going to be crazy. Well, asking the question: um, What did the children of Israel had to complain about? What were the hardships? Hardships complained about. Go back to your. I'm going back. And people wanted to know where it was, so I was showing them stage station stops. Making me dizzy. Well, I have to go back to where it was. Okay. All right. Yeah. Well, they. I don't know. It looks like they don't have anything. I'm looking on the web and I don't see anything. Well, I guess living in the wilderness like that in a camp is different from living in uh, Egypt where you had a city and, you know, 
social things, I suppose, going on. And I don't know, you know. Um, person is that? This is Holman Christian Standard. I was going to say, because the word hardships is not in here. Yeah, I have complaints, but you get yeah, that. Well, they have complained in here, but yeah. that word is not there. That's what's throwing me. Like, it doesn't exist. Well, you can pick whatever version you want. It's still Numbers 11 1. Yeah, but 11 1, it says, and the people complained, it displeased the Lord. It didn't say they, what they complained about. It said they complained. And that's why I was curious. Yeah. And why I couldn't understand, why I couldn't figure it out. I'm looking at the Berean Standard Bible, and it also says... You know, they wouldn't have been there if they had done what he told in them. The, to in the complete Jewish Bible, it does uh, use the word hardships, but the people began complaining about their hardships to Adonai. That's a complete Jewish Bible, but it's not in the King James. And I, I forgot to look this up, but what does taberna mean? It means burning. burning. Yeah, I figured. looked that one up, burning. It means burning simply, you know, that's what it never ends to. Let's see. So I know it's a little incident, and I don't mean to make a lot out of a little bit, but it's a it says that God is a consuming fire, right? He's a jealous God. What I think is interesting is it says this was all the encircled the outskirts of the camp. So yeah. around the outside. It was consumed by fire. The threat was either that they couldn't escape or that the fire was going to make its way in the center of the camp. And God, you know, Moses prayed and it was stopped. So let's look at some other other places that talk about this incident. Um, and one of the places, strangely enough, is Philippians chapter two, starting at verse 12 and going through verse 17. Walter, can I have a reader? You may. Let's see. I got to get everybody back in line where they were. So uh, respond to last. Yeah, I, I got to mute everybody to find out who's next. Get my order back. All right. Let's see where were we here. All right. So we did Fonda. Okay. Now it's Gerald's turn. Yes. And you'll need to unmute. So. Just okay. so you, I mute y'all so I can keep all the background noise out because it gets really bad sometimes. So can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Okay, Philippians 2, shining as stars, verse 12. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. Do everything without complaining or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure children of God without fault and a crooked and depraved generation in which you shine like stars in the universe as you hold out the word of life in order that I may boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor for nothing but even if I am being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith I am glad and rejoice with you all all of you, so you too should be glad and rejoice with me. So, Gerald, in this chapter, it's making the same warning to us that we're getting from rebellion number six, which was complaining in the fire that came. Um, and here we're told we're not to complain as believers because we're supposed to shine like stars in the heavens um because we're holding out the book of life to the rest who are dying um what would you also take from this um as a bridge between rebellion six of complaining and what we should be doing well in in the context of that philippian letter it, paul is uh alluding to the fact that he's probably not going to ever see them again in person and so he's saying um there in verse 12 that they had always obeyed not only in his presence but much more in his absence and he says continue to work out your salvation of fear and trembling without the apostle paul's presence or his or his intervention or uh support uh and he says uh for reassurance he says for it is god who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose 
And so he says, do everything without complaining or arguing. That seems to be the uh, the bridge there in their reliance upon God, that God is uh, going to work with them and in them in order to um, uh, see them through the difficult times. And uh, they, therefore, no need for complaining or arguing if they trust truly in God to perform. Very good. Thank you very much. So um, there's more to consider. And I'm going to go on to the next one, which is from Isaiah chapter 30, verse 24. And so this is a recollection by the prophet Isaiah, again, echoing back to the rebellions in the wilderness and specifically to number six. So um, who's our next reader? Joanne Suck. Go ahead, Joanne. Isaiah 30, 27. See, the name of the Lord comes from afar with burning anger and dense clouds of smoke. His lips are full of wrath and his tongue is a consuming fire. His breath is like the rushing torrent rising up to the neck. He shakes the nations in the sieve of destruction. He places in the jaws of the people a bit that leads them astray. And you will sing as on the night you celebrate a holy festival. Your hearts will rejoice as when people go up with flutes to the mountain of the Lord, to the rock of Israel. The Lord will cause men to hear his majestic voice and will make them see his arm coming down with raging anger and consuming fire. With cloud burst, thunder, storm, and hail. The voice of the Lord will shadow Assyria with his scepter. He will strike them down. Every stroke the Lord lays on them with his pursuing rod will be to the music of tambourines and harps as he fights them in battle with the blows of his arm. Torhith his, okay. has long been prepared. It has been made ready for the king. It's fire pit has been made deep and wide with an abundance of wood. The breath of the Lord, like a stream of burning sulfur, will set so, it ablaze. Great, thank you. So it's talking about the wrath of the Lord as a consuming fire, um, basically showing you his anger in the clouds of smoke, a lips are full of wrath, tongue is a consuming fire. And all of this is because he's going to bring this sieve of destruction against the people who hate his people. Um, and you can see that this is all going to happen to music, <laughs> which is really strange at the end. It says, this raging anger, consuming fire, the cloud bursts, the thunderstorms, and the hail is all going to be put to the music of tambourines and harps. Um, which is pretty strange in the end of the end of that verse, but it's because they have um, complained about his people and they're going to go through his judgments. Um, the next one is talking about what we we often hear in Second Peter chapter three that the first earth was destroyed by fire, sorry by water, and the second earth is going to be destroyed by fire. Well, Joe. Yeah. Hey, could you back up to that next, uh, the previous slide? Yep. Just a word about Tophet. Um, you know, Tophet stands for and symbolizes uh, uh, destruction in that Tophet literally was that uh, uh, refuse, place of refuse and garbage and city dump and, and so forth south of Jerusalem in the time of, uh, of, the, of this, of Israel, and also in the time of Christ for that matter, but uh, Tobet stands for then the uh, the place of destruction, and that that's what that reference is to Tobet. That in verse twenty three, Tobet has long been prepared; it has been made ready for the king. Its fire pit has been made deep and wide with an abundance. It, it was a fearful thing to think about Tobet. That's where all the criminals and the bodies of the criminals were cast out, and uh, you know Christ even used that. Um, uh, concept of topet in his uh, in his warnings and so forth. That so it really was a place that people dreaded, and uh, 
and, and feared in that it was a, a, a final place of destruction. And a consuming destruction that right, would be, right, except ash. So, um, I I'll try to make an analogy if I could. If it was a husband's anniversary and he came home with flowers, a card, and candy, and brought home dinner, and then his wife did nothing but complain about him. Yeah. That would be pretty egregious to the husband. And that's exactly what's kind of happening here is God has taken beautiful care of Israel. Later on, you read the analogy in Isaiah that says, you know, you were a baby in your own blood down there in Egypt and you grew and I washed you and dressed you and put gold earrings on you and brought you up out of Egypt and took care of you, but you used everything I gave you, the gold, the clothing, to chase after your lovers. Mm -hmm. You didn't pursue me. And so that's exactly what this must feel like to the Lord and why he, there's this burning fire of jealousy is what I would say when they complain about their hardships in the sixth um, one. And we see the same thing talking about, we don't have to read this one, but it's about the first earth was destroyed by water. Second earth is going to be destroyed by fire um, because there's scoffers on the earth. It's like, where's his coming? Everybody said he was going to be here by now and he isn't here. Um, but he's like, God is not, God is patient, but he is not going to put up with that. And it's going to destroy all the ungodly men. So the purpose of the fire is it's a fire of jealousy to remove that element that is disloyal and also that complains um, to the Lord. So I want to skip this one again. So in Corinthians chapter three, it talks about this complaining again. Um, can I get a reader for this one, Walter? Uh, Passy, please. First Corinthians three, by the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as an expert builder and someone else is building on it. But each one should be careful how he builds for no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. Any man builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw. His work will be shown for what it is because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire and the fire will test the quality of each man's work. If what he has built survives, he will receive his reward. If it is burned up, he will suffer loss. He himself will be saved, but only as one escaping through the flames. So I know this seems like a little bit of a stretch, but when we're looking at the Rebellion Six, they're complaining about their hardships and God sending a fire. That fire isn't some ancient thing that happened to them in the desert. It's something that every person is going to have to go through. Um, and it can be a refining fire or it can reveal that you built well and everything stood withstood the fire. Um, so, and that fire is tribulation in our life. It isn't a literal fire. Um, but I think it's interesting that they complained about their hardships and everything was almost lost. Um, it could have torn through the entire camp and burned everything. Yes, Walter. So it's probably good to remember that before them was the pillar of fire, mm -hmm. which was a guiding light that provided protection and to them, yet another example of God's mercy to them. I love them. Mm -hmm. And so, but then because of their sin, instead of it separating them from their enemy, it marked them as behaving as enemies of God. And as you pointed out, fire was a very purifying thing. Unless it has substance to it, fire will destroy it and utterly take it away. So it was a beautiful sign of protection that, that got turned to his wrath because of their behavior. Mm -hmm. 
So it's just scary, you know, to all of us because I'm, I'm, I don't know about you guys, but I'm a champion a planner, man. I can use great vocabulary, <laughs> but we, we need to realize it's not a godly characteristic. Can I I'll throw yeah. out something? I okay. just maybe came up in this class. I don't know, but um, it, God took care of all their needs and they, they really should not have complained from where they were, where they were being, you know, just thrown out to vultures and when they died in in Egypt but the the logistical challenges that would have come with moving two million people through the desert and never having a home there would be a lot of things that would affect us that we were used to having notice how they talked about things they used to have and used to have and used to have well you're suddenly a, a community of people in the desert and every few months or a couple of years, you got to pick up two million people and start them through movie. Um, we we when we think about camping, we think about how easy it is to pack up our tent, move on to the next spot. It wasn't anything like that. It was enormous uh, undertaking, logistical you know, nightmare. Yeah, it was, and it would be a very challenging in in an environment like that. So there would be things just like we have in our life. We have things that are very challenging and things sometimes we don't want to go places, but maybe that's where God's leading us. And uh, we can't tell God what he should have done or how it should have been. But uh, they brought uh, they brought it on themselves for 40 years. I mean, they had the opportunity if they obeyed him, they could have walked right into the land within a few months, uh, I believe. So anyway. Yes, Walter. So often... We can be like them. We see them or call them hardships, but what they were were tests of character from God to refine them. Right. Yet they chose to look at them like God is against me, as opposed to God is a loving father and he's trying to shape you and mold you to be one of his sons, if you will, one of his people. And that's what we have to look at them. When you get these tough trials and tribulations that come upon you, stop looking for the dark cloud. Mm -hmm. Start asking yourself, what is God's message here? What am I missing or what do I need to know I don't know? And thanks for trying to help me with whatever it is I need to find out. And it's hard to do that, but that's what we have to do. He right. said, did most to see whether they would keep his law or not. Exactly. Uh, that, that was what it was all brought in. They had to deal with them mm -hmm. and he fed them but he fed them the same thing for for years and that would be a challenge to any of us in the you know when we, we can't have even our, you know, go to the same restaurant from sunday <laughs> to sunday you know, we were there last week i'm like okay they couldn't see the significance yeah. of being fed the same thing that was consistent and exact every day mm -hmm. the word of god is unchanging and unvarying they should have picked up on the fact there's something he's trying to teach me with the fact that it's the same every day. You can take the word and use it in different ways, but it's going to be the same. Yeah. They didn't have to work for it either. Exactly. It there. Yeah. No, they didn't have I just the lash over them. Okay, so the seventh is where we have craving going on. And it's yes. confusing because when they were given manna in the other incident, they were also given quail. So I don't know what the difference is here, but they were given more quail. Um, so it's in Numbers 11. And as I said, this is the seventh rebellion. And there is a consequence to this one, too. Can I have a reader for Numbers 11? Yes, yeah. Susie, please. Unmute. Numbers 11, quail from the Lord. The rabble with them began to crave other food. And again, the Israelites started wailing and said, if only we had meat to eat. We remember the fish we ate in Egypt at no cost. Also the cucumbers, melons, leeks, onions, and garlic. But now we have lost our appetite. We never see anything but this manna. The manna was like coriander seed and looked like resin. The people went around gathering it and then ground it in a hand mill or, a, or crushed it in a mortar. They cooked it in a pot or made it into cakes. And it tasted like something made with olive oil when the dew settled on the camp at night. The manna also came down. Moses heard the people of every family wailing, each at the entrance to his tent. The Lord became exceedingly angry and Moses was troubled. 
He asked the Lord, why have you brought us this trouble on your servant? What have I done to displease you that you put the burden of all these people on me? Did I conceive all these people? Um, did I give them birth? Why do you tell me to carry them in my arms as a nurse carries an infant to the land you promised an oath to their forefathers? Where can I get meat for all these people? They keep wailing to me, give us meat to eat. I cannot carry all these people by myself. The burden is too heavy for me. So part of the issue here is, is that Moses has taken their further complaining um, personally. Like he has to come up with the answer for this and provide food for all these people. He doesn't question whether or not it's a good request or whether the rabble among them should even be listened to. Um, instead, he takes the burden on and he casts his burden on to the Lord in a way is like, are you going to treat me like this? You know, did I birth all these people? Did I, you know, nurse them and bring them up? I did not. And he's like, you know, this burden is way too heavy for me. So the craving is in all of us. There is no way to deny it, no way to quench it. When we want something, we're going to go get it. Um, it's, it's very, very hard to stop ourselves from craving where almost anything is concerned. Um, and with the people here, they were looking back at what they had. And you can almost say, okay, they didn't really know what they wanted. They just knew what they didn't want. Does that make sense? They didn't want any more manna. They wanted something else. Their taste buds were bored. They lost their appetite. So they, they could also they could also smell that meat cooking uh, in sacrifices. So to to see that meat cooking and smelling it all through the camp, it would have been difficult. But 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 Susie, they could make, have meat from their own flock at any time. They could have beef for dinner. They could have lamb. They could. I, that's what I don't understand. Their flocks and herds were not harmed in the plagues of Egypt. All of the Egyptian cows and sheep and goats and camels died, but not in the land of Goshen. So they walked out with every hoof they started with. So that's why I don't understand. It's like, if you don't have meat, then have some lamb chop. <laughs> have some beef. You've got all these animals with you in the desert. But they specifically say things that they don't have, like cucumbers, melons, leeks, onions, and fish. Now, fish is something they can't get their hand on. Right. So they never mentioned quail, and they didn't mention cows, and they didn't mention lambs or any of that stuff. So it's like, what don't you really have? That's why I've always wondered about this. It's never made any sense to me. You know, I, don't think, I don't think they were at liberty to eat uh, those animals that they brought out of Egypt with them. Uh, yes, they were. Those were reserved for uh, sacrificial purposes under Yahweh, one, and particularly once the tabernacle in the wilderness was, was set up and operative, uh, those animals were to be reserved for, for uh, sacrifice to God. Otherwise, only, yeah, only, why, wouldn't, why wouldn't they have eaten them? Um, only, only a few would have had that. Not every, that was millions of animals. And, and that not all of that was reserved for the Levites. They, they had it with them. So that's why I think it's important to look at this and go look at what the grocery list was. The grocery list is stuff they could not get in the desert. Fish, cucumbers, melons, leeks, and onions. Everything else they brought with them into the desert. I mean, they ate the Passover lambs before they left Egypt. They still had flocks and herds. They still had sheep they could eat. Um, so that's what I. That's why it's important to really look at this and say, okay, did they just have manna to eat? Was that the only thing on their menu? And it was not. Yes. So. But it seems to me that uh, the restrictions on the the animals uh, that they brought out of Egypt with them 
was uh, purposely, it was purposely, purposely uh, not allowed for con human consumption in that it really was to force them to put their total and full reliance upon Yahweh's provision for them. I there mean, was, there, was, there was in the midst of them, these animals just, you know, all around them, and they could not eat them, and yet, not true, though. They, yet they, they were being provided for by, you know, Yahweh from heaven, and, and that's what I think the lesson of the trial really was about, that, that they had to learn how to depend upon Yahweh to provide for them, and it was conditional in, in that they trusted him and obeyed him, that he would reciprocate and provide for their every need. I know Walter had was going to make a point before you jumped in, but I'll let Walter go ahead. Well, I'm, what I'm going to say echoes with what Brother Gerald is saying, the sense that the bigger picture of lesson to you is God was providing a food, both spiritual and physical, mm -hmm. and that he wanted them to focus on what he provided. The manna was certainly one thing to point out a lesson. There were other things they could have eaten upon. Um, these other things, of course, were all natural things they were desiring. So you see spiritual, you see natural. They were unwilling to take the spiritual manna, the food God provided. That wasn't good enough. We wanted the natural food of the earth, if you will, mm -hmm. like most people want those kind of things. And it's interesting in all the scripture, when you look at manna, Nowhere does anyone say to God, thank you for this manna. How do I fix it? How's the best way to cook it or prepare it? Perhaps God would have told him a way to do it that you would have said, I want this every day. But no, they chose to do what they wanted to do with things instead of inquiring of God. That's all I want. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm just trying to put out to you that the craving was for things they literally could not find in the desert. That's, That's all I'm saying. Yeah. And the grocery list they put in here was certainly things you could not get in the desert. Yeah. Most of them are spices and watery kind of melons, but God gave them everything else. They mm -hmm. didn't, I, and I'm I'm telling you, they there's it's it, I, I almost find it impossible that they just ate manna solo. Um, uh, because the if the Levites were eating it, you know the rest of them were eating it. So it just doesn't make a whole lot of sense that they would, you know, not be allowed to eat their cattle or to eat. This. Certainly there would be some that would be sacrificed, but that's not billions of animals that were brought out there. So it's only supposed to feed, they only had to give a tenth. Anyway, so the point, as we, we belabored here, is that the craving was for things they couldn't have. And it's the same for us instead of the spiritual um food so we can get a reader for this one walter yes last thing if i may say on the point you're trying to make they had cravings for things they couldn't have but were specifically mentioned to be of egypt mm -hmm. they wanted subtly to say return me back to the world i was in not the world god wants me in and that's the lesson for us we don't want to lose sight of it's all about not wanting to go back to those things we had in the world but looking forward. Oh, yes. And your next reader, let's see, we did Susie. Um, we're over to Roger. On this one? Okay. If you can see it. Let me get a little closer. Let's see. If uh, Seventh Rebellion Craving uh, 15, what's the book? What's the number? Let's see. Numbers 11. Numbers this 11. Is just a continuation of the previous week. It's easier to read that. You can read the that one. Uh, that's even small. I'll read from here. Thanks. <laughs> I tried. If this is how you are going to treat me, put me to death right now. If I have found favor in your eyes and do not let me face my own ruin. The Lord said to Moses, bring me 70 of Israel's elders who are known to you as leaders and officials among the people. Have them become, have them come to the tent of meeting that they may stand there with you. I will come down and speak with you there, and I will take of the spirit that is on you and put it, the spirit on them. They will help you carry the burden of people so that you will not have to carry it alone. Tell the people, consecrate yourselves in preparation for tomorrow. 
when you will eat meat. The Lord heard you when you were when you wailed. If only we had meat to eat, we were better off in Egypt. Now the Lord will give you meat to eat, and you will eat it. And you will not eat it for just one day or two days or five, ten, or twenty days, but for the whole month until it comes out of your nostrils and <laughs> because you have rejected the Lord who is among you and have wailed before him saying, why did we ever leave Egypt? So the Lord brings home the point on this. What he's most angry with is not that they ask for meat, but what Walter had picked up on before, they were craving the things that they could only buy in the market in Cairo or in Memphis, or in Alexandria, because they were stamped on the bottom, made in Egypt. <laughs> and so in this case, he's like, I'm going to give you what you want, and you're going to choke on it. Um, and what I find really interesting is when the quail comes, it's three feet high, and three days walk in any direction that's a lot of quail and basically they couldn't eat their way out of camp they were stuck there until they ate it all so i mean it's incredible and and i want to wrap a bow around all of the rebellions the first set of 10 and the second set of 10 this is the biggest one of all okay if you were going to tie it the biggest ribbon that's the connector between them all is this. Man is always trying to live at God's power. In every single case, they're like, can you really provide water for all these people? Can you provide quail for all these people? Can you provide um, bread in the desert? You know, can you really conquer these nations when we go in? It's always um, man limiting God's power. And that's what's at the root of all of this. We cannot have an, an expansive enough mind to appreciate the vastness of God, his love, his mercy, his forbearance, his patience. And because our minds are so finite, we're constantly limiting, limiting God. Don't believe any limits on the Lord. The only things I can think of is he can't be tempted, he can't sin, and he really has a difficult time working with stubborn and arrogant people. Besides that, I don't know, and he can't break his pro promises and covenants. I don't know of a whole lot of other things that he cannot do. Well, the naysayers will tell you, can God make a rock that he cannot lift up? Yes, yeah, that's the kind of crap you got to be careful about when you say God logic. can't do things. Yeah. It creates this crazy circle of crap that no one can deal with. Uh, but in this passage, before you leave it, there's some important threads that it's not exactly germane, but it's important to see. Mm -hmm. We often remind and teach people, you have Moses, you have Joshua. Joshua representing that salvation and reflecting Christ. And you have Moses' law. And of course, law won't lead you into the promised land. It is that Joshua. Notice here how the character of Moses is portrayed to you. I have all the burden upon me and I cannot bear it. Take the spirit, the power you've given to me, and spread it among others. Who is the exact opposite of that statement? Christ says, give me all your burdens and lay them upon me, and I will take them all. So you see Moses, his law and his way of thinking, he couldn't even handle the very burdens of the men, the people. And so God said, I will spread it among someone else then to help you. Well, with the, the, the ideal vision was, though, is that they were supposed to be an entire kingdom of priests yeah, to teach the world how yes. to serve them. So yes. anyway, but I appreciate your point. Um, anybody else before we move on? Going once, going twice, sold. All right. So we're continuing reading about this craving and what happened because it wasn't that they wanted meat. It was that they accused again and they wanted something that they didn't have in the desert. So he didn't give them fish. It wasn't Sharknado where they dropped a bunch of fish in the area. Um, so let's finish reading from verse 21 to 26. Linda. 
But Moses said, here I am among 600,000 men on foot, and you say, I will give them meat to eat for a whole month. Would they have enough if flocks and herds were slaughtered for them? Would they have enough if all the fish in the sea were caught for them? The Lord answered Moses, is the Lord's arm too short? You will now see whether or not what I say will come true for you. So Moses went out and told the people what the Lord had said. He brought together 70 of their elders and had them stand around the tent. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke with him. And he took of the spirit that was on him and put the spirit on the 70 elders. When the spirit rested on them, they prophesied, but they did not do so again. However, two men whose names were Eldad and Medad had remained in the camp. They were listed among the elders, but did not go out to the tent. Yet the spirit also rested on them and they prophesied in the camp. And the importance of that is, is that God wanted a kingdom of priests. And in the next passage, it was, I believe, Joshua, son of Nun, who comes and tells him um, that what was going to happen. Can you all read this okay? Um, I'll just read it. A young man ran and told Moses, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. Joshua, son of Nun, who had been Moses' aide since youth, spoke up and said, Moses, my Lord, stop them. But Moses replied, are you jealous for my sake? I wish that all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put his spirit on them. Then Moses and the elders of Israel turned to the camp. Now the wind came out from the Lord and drove the quail from the sea and brought them all around the camp about three feet above the ground, as far as a day's walk in any direction. All that day and night and all the next day, the people went out and gathered quail. No one gathered less than 10 homers. And they spread them out all around the camp. But while the meat was still between their teeth and before it could be consumed, the anger of the Lord burned against his people and he struck them with a severe plague. Therefore, the place was named Kibroth Hatava because there were buried people who had craved other foods. So they choked on it. I don't know whether it was bad quail or what the situation was, but you're seeing the whole thing. And so what is overlapped with this story about the craving of meat, the going back to Egypt, the providing of the quail, that's quite unique. I don't know what you're driving at, but what comes to my mind is that um, it's that principle where not only Moses, but later it echoed by our Lord Jesus that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God shall men live by. So, Exactly. Well, I just think it's interesting that God spreads his spirit from Moses to all these elders of the camp. And Moses tells them, here's the real vision, folks that you all are all supposed to be priests um, to all the nations. And he's like, don't be jealous for my sake. It's not exclusive, but we always make it exclusive because we're always limiting the power of God. And so this is what I think is interesting. In the same, in the same breath, Moses says, can you really feed all these people? And this is Moses saying this, not the people. He's like, there's 600,000 people here. If you were to get all the fish out of the ocean, it wouldn't be enough. And the Lord's like, not only can I provide my wisdom to the entire nation to make you a nation of priests, I can also provide enough food. So the spiritual food and the natural food is being dovetailed in the same story. He's telling them, I can make out of you, Moses, many more people who can serve me and I can do the natural thing too. I can provide food for all these people. I can feed all these people and I can spiritually feed all these people. So 
Moses and the elders became a force multiplier so that more people would know the righteous judgments of the Lord. And he fed all these people. Then he reduced the natural by killing those who craved the meat in the first place. Does that make sense? So what's unique about the story is that you get the dovetailing of two things, the great increase of the knowledge of the Lord through the 70 elders receiving the spirit from Moses and this mass feeding by three feet of quail, a day's walk in every direction. So that's pretty neat stuff, I think, how they're both put together. Um, so Psalms 106.13 says, but they soon forgot what they had done and did not wait for his counsel, which is something that Walter was saying. In the desert, they gave in to their craving. In the wasteland, they put God to the test. So he gave them what they asked for, but sent a wasting disease among them. Could have been, um, what's that, what's that bird, bird flu thing? Avian. Avian. The avian flu could have been. As my grandmother used to say, when chicken was sitting out for two seconds on the counter, you're going to get salmonella poisoning. Well, that's or, what was it? Point. Botulism. That yeah. was the other one. That's a point. If you're a day's walk and you're trying to eat quail that's been sitting there that long out in the desert. <laughs> it was just like it was fresh. It was like still between their teeth. They haven't even swallowed yeah. it and he killed them. Yes. I, on this one thing, I would be inclined to call it uh, the seven rebellion, not just craving, I would call it lust. They had a lust for things beyond the amount that they should have asked for. That's what I think of when I say, it wasn't just, can you send me a, oh, just 10 quail, please give me a few quail, I'll be okay. It was, then this all is me, take care of us. And he, he gave them to fill their lust. And as you pointed out, for those who didn't have the faith, didn't trust and believe in God, they died from the thing that they wanted so much. Isn't that what the world does to us? We go crave it, lust for it, and take it into our souls. It kills us. Well, what I what I would also like, it's a little nuance. Mm -hmm. is this is while it was still stuck between their teeth, before they had swallowed it, yes. they died. Mm -hmm. And isn't that the case with true cravings and lust, Walter? Mm -hmm. Is that the moment you're going to savor that pleasure, mm -hmm. it's dashed from your lips. It's taken away. You see that with Samson over and over again. He wants to dabble in the in the flesh, and every time, it doesn't satisfy. <clears throat> he gets a haircut. He goes blind. The whole nine yards. So um, we're going to get to a subject. We have it's seven fifty five. Yes. I mean, just a quick comment. Everything that we've discussed this evening to me just emphasizes the aspect of our faith because we're told to believe in a God that none of us have ever seen physically and we're told to teach others of all the things that we learn in his scripture so our faith and how strong it is is most important for us to accomplish the things that we're talking about tonight and trust in the Lord Excellent. Thank you very much. That's why I said the main word to me was faithlessness. Yes. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, you know, I, I can't help but believe that uh, Jesus had this incident that we've been discussing in mind when he was giving his Sermon on the Mount, and he touched on this same issue about worrying about what we're going to eat and worrying about what we're going to drink and worrying about our clothing, etc. cetera. In, in Matthew chapter 6, you know, he says, Therefore, I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, and not about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? And then he goes on down. He says, therefore, do not worry, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For after all of these things, the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all of these things. But seek first his kingdom, the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things shall be provided for you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, 
Tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is the, its own evil that we should uh, address. So to me, that's what Christ was. I think he had this in mind, this incident we're talking about, very much in mind when he uh, expounded on that in his Sermon on the Mount and uh, with his contemporaries there. And But he also did it in the wilderness when he was driven by the Holy Spirit. Yeah, that's true, yeah. By the, you know, turning this rock into bread, and he says, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Mm -hmm. Walter. And right. then it's, it's all, it's just like, a, like Brother um, Gerald is saying, the echo back. He took and fed 5,000 with fish mm -hmm. and bread. All right, you got what you wanted from the wilderness, all right? What did they do with it? Oh, we just want more natural food. We don't care what you have to teach us. Mm -hmm. So he proved them. Even if I gave you fish and melons and things, it would have made no difference. <laughs> I'm just showing the yeah, echo that yeah. comes through the wave. Sure it's no that. surprise that he chose what he did to feed them with, I don't think. No, not at all. So thank you all for attending tonight. I'm going to get Walter to give a closing prayer. Sure. Our kind and truly merciful Heavenly Father, we thank thee that we are in your hand, that you provide guidance and directions, that you help sustain this poor and weak and mortal flesh until the time thy son returns, that we might be about thy business and do thy will. We will pray that you will give us these days to do such a thing as that, to turn our hearts and minds to thy will. We thank thee for what you give us, the substances that you provide for us. Teach us, instruct us, help us not to be complainers and murmurers, but to look at everything that comes in our lives to say thank you for it and to ask for guidance and understanding in those things that don't quite leave the right taste in our mouth. Because we know you're trying to train us and teach us and you're showing love to us. We thank for this time together and the many words we've studied, for the insights inside people and the hardships and challenges they face. The worst being that they've not put their faith in you. We thank you now for all these things who wait for the coming of thy son and establish of thy kingdom here upon the faces of earth. We pray for these things in the name of thy son, Jesus to Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you all for attending. And I just want to give a caveat. I don't ever want to come across like I'm being self-righteous about what these people were like in the wilderness because every one of their rebellions I face, I don't know about you, all the time. So it's hard not to complain. It's hard to not crave things you shouldn't crave. It's hard to see beyond ourselves when we're up against an obstacle like the Red Sea. So, you know, it's about giving God the room to work in our lives um, and not jumping to conclusions and not limiting God's power. But thank you all for coming. And we're going to be here next week and we'll cover eight through 10, hopefully. Thank you, Brother Joe. Thank you, guys. Very good effort. Thank mm -hmm. you, sir. And we'll, like Thanks. I said, it's just 10 rebellions, and there's another set of post rebellions. So it doesn't end when we get to 10. <laughs> All right, y'all have a good night. Good night. God bless. Good night. And you too. Good night. Good night. Good night.